In the last week and a half, we have read an entire gospel account. We have followed Jesus from birth to his ministry and through his death and resurrection. In the coming weeks, we will read three other such gospel accounts. So what makes Matthew different? Matthew really bridged the gap between the Old and the New Testaments, or just between life under the Torah and life under the New Covenant of Christ. Matthew's account presents Jesus as the new Moses, as the long-awaited Davidic deliverer, and it specifically connects the early church back to its Jewish heritage, and it shows that all Christians, Jews or Gentiles, have a legitimate claim to Israel's rich heritage. This book proves Jesus is Messiah by showing how he fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament and continues on in this way. By the way, the whole Old and New Testament distinction kind of bothers me because it's not just arbitrarily Old Testament, New Testament, but rather it is one continuing story of how God keeps his promises towards his people and shows his love to them. Matthew balances all of this prophetic fulfillment with instructions on how to embrace the new world that Jesus reveals. In his gospel account, Matthew also serves to give an instruction manual on how to embrace and live in the new world under the new covenant that Jesus creates. It shows us that it is God, through Christ, inviting us along into this overwhelming and overcoming story of God creating the world and his covenant towards us. God calls us into the task of not only being disciples, but in helping to make them as well. One central topic, or the thesis statement, if you will, of all of Matthew's gospel is that Jesus is the promised and long-awaited Messiah, come to earth to free the Jewish people. Another way to put this, as I said, is that Jesus is the new Moses. So the Jewish people were expecting someone like Moses, someone to come in and devastate the Romans as the plague said devastate the Egyptians and to free the people. They got the whole freeing God's people thing right, but they completely misunderstood the method and they fundamentally missed the point. They were so focused on this military overthrow that they missed Jesus when he was right in front of them. That's why Matthew had to write this gospel, to set the record straight and say, wait, look, this guy is the real deal. You see how he has fulfilled all of these prophecies? See, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the fulfillment of everything God has promised to us. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and so many of God's people in general during this time missed Jesus when he was right in front of them. They, they just missed him. They missed the point because they were so blinded by their own expectations. A savior who humbles himself to the point of death on the cross, who proclaims that the last shall be first and the first shall be last, that the greatest is the servant of all, that we have to lose our faith to find it, that there is no limit to forgiveness, this makes no sense to us. It is the opposite from what we would expect, from our natural reactions, and yet it's the truth. It's who Christ is, who he came, and who he forever shall be. And we can't let these expectations keep us from seeing this great reality. Another major theme in Matthew's gospel is discipleship. This is a teaching book, one that tells us how to be a disciple and a follower of Christ, and it specifically does this by tying the early church and all of us back to its Jewish heritage. He does not just erase the Old Testament and all of its laws and regulations, but he clarifies them into how they apply in the new covenant that Christ is creating under love. Christ is our sole instructor who holds all authority and power and whose commands must be obeyed. Jesus relaxes some of the purity restrictions of the Torah when he says things like, it is not what goes into a person that defiles them, but what comes out of them. But he also intensifies some of the Torah's more teachings. Like when he says that we need to be merciful just as God himself is merciful. When he says things like this, it is not just um, commands and instructions that are great ideas and lofty goals, but these are legitimate instructions that he generally wants us to follow wholeheartedly. Jesus calls us to follow him, and in following him, we have to actually listen to him and obey him. 
One disciple who I think embodies both of these themes pretty well, missing the point, and what it means to be a disciple is Peter. In my children's church days, I really did not understand their disciples and Peter especially. They just seemed so clueless. They were living day in and day out of Jesus, and yet they were constantly missing the point, constantly confused by Jesus and by what he was going to do. One of the first times we saw Peter this week, he was walking on water towards Jesus. However, he lost sight of him and started to sink when he got distracted by the storm. This guy had enough faith to walk on water, but he got so consumed with this honed fear and anxiety that he started to sink. When Peter got on that water, the storm did not stop. It didn't stop until Peter and Jesus both got back into the boat. So Peter had to step out onto that water in faith. But when the storm became too much and when he lost sight of God, he began to sink. However, Jesus was right there to lift him back up again. Being a great disciple is not just having the faith to step out onto the water. It's also having the faith to take hold of Jesus and reach and look for him when you start to sink. The next time we see Peter, Jesus asks him that famous question, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus might not have been who the disciples and who Peter was expecting them to be. Peter might have gotten confused and turned around and started to drown at some point. But he still fundamentally got who Jesus was. In this quote, Peter gets it. And yet, later in the same chapter, Jesus predicts his own death and resurrection, and Peter rebukes Jesus. He says, oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Peter sees and knows Jesus. He recognizes him as Messiah, but he still places his own ideas and expectations onto Jesus, and so he misses the point, and he misses what Jesus is there to do. Then, after hearing Jesus give one of his parables, Peter connects some of the dots, and he connects that those who give it all up on off to follow Christ will have a great reward in heaven. Once again, this is fundamentally correct, but he misses the point. Jesus confirms that yes, the disciples and those who give up things to follow Christ will have a great reward in heaven, but this is not the point. The point is, that the first will be last and the last will be first. So for us, instead of congratulating ourselves when we give things up for Christ, or when we've done so much, you will have so many jewels and our crown in heaven or whatever, we have to step back and realize that the reward is not the point. The point is putting ourselves last and solving others first. Now we transition into Holy Week, where we begin with Peter denying that he will deny Christ um, at the Last Supper. <laughs> Peter denies that he will deny Christ because he just cannot see the truth and the reality of what Jesus has done and what he will do. Then we move into the garden where Jesus tells his disciples that he is deeply grieved to the point of death and Jesus implores the disciples to pray for him and to stay awake with him, and they fall asleep. <laughs> I often question how they could see Jesus so upset and still fall asleep in the garden. And then I also wonder if I am still sleeping. As we move on, we see Peter watch as Jesus gets arrested and as he stands trial, and Peter's entire world is shaken up. He left everything behind to follow Christ. And now, because he wasn't listening when Jesus told him that he had to die, that he had to go through all of these things so that he could then be resurrected and so that God's will could be fulfilled, he is terrified and frightened and alone, and he ultimately ends up denying Christ three times, just as Jesus said he would, and just as Peter denied that he would ever do. Throughout all of Matthew, and especially into Acts, and 
what we know of the early church, we know that Peter has a strong faith. However, through all of this, we see that even the strongest of faiths can have weak points. Even the strongest of faiths can have blind spots. Peter really is blind <laughs> at some points, but then again, so are we. And luckily, luckily enough, the story does not end on Good Friday. The disciples' mourning is interrupted by joy when Jesus rises from the dead and appeals to the disciples. He instructs the disciples again and gives them the Great Commission. He tells them not only to live as he has taught them, but to go and make disciples of all nations and to teach them to live as Jesus had taught. He gives the disciples an opportunity to rise above their past mistakes, to live in faith rather than in the fear and doubt that had fell upon the disciples when Jesus was arrested. In terms of authority and strength and knowledge, there ain't nothing like the apostles. They were the ones with the first-hand experiences, they were the first spreaders of the gospel, and they got to see Jesus face to face and walk with him every day. And yet, they messed up too. They were human with human thoughts, but still they sold the Lord and followed where he sent them. It is by placing his own desires and expectations onto Christ that Peter fundamentally misses the resurrection narrative. He sleeps in the garden, he denies Christ, and he is surprised by the resurrection all because he was so caught up in who he thought Jesus was and what he thought was going to happen that he didn't step back and realize and listen to Jesus when he was right in front of him. Peter might not have known what he was doing exactly. Jesus might have been the opposite of what Peter expected. And yet Peter still stuck around and faithfully followed, showing us that we can miss the point at times and yet still follow. God wants perfection, but he still accepts our wholehearted approaches with love and with joy. So as we go throughout this next week and as we continue reading the Gospels, let's think about all the ways that God has kept his promises, even when the fulfillment of those promises was the exact opposite of what we were expecting. God is always faithful, even when we do not understand and even when we miss the point. Sometimes there can be tension when the fulfillment of God's promises does not match all expectations. But this does not mean that God isn't good. It just means that we are stubborn and we are blinded by expectations and how we want things to be. God is going to do things that do not make sense to us and that we do not understand. But there is beauty when we are flexible enough and open enough to see where God is leading us and for us to follow even when we were thought we were going to go in an entirely different direction. Sometimes we can be like Peter when we just absolutely miss the point. However, our faith still needs to be like Peter's where we persevere anyway, and we keep following anyway, because God is leading us and God is faithful and be praying that our eyes will be opened. The beauty of all of this is that while Christ calls us to follow and gives us clear instructions on how to do so, he's also always ready to take hold of us and to lift us up when we focus on the storm and we start to drown. The beauty is that God keeps his promises. He just does. If he promises it, it will happen. It just might not look how we expect. Take a moment today and think, what is God doing that I am missing because I am so consumed with myself and with my perceptions of what I think things should be like. How am I missing God? We all need to have our eyes open a little wider and our hearts a little more in tune with the Spirit of God so that we do not miss the point and miss God when he makes good on his promises because he will always make good on them. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this opportunity to read the Gospels together as a church body and as your people. Lord, as we go throughout this week and as we continue to read, keep our eyes open. 
keep all hearts open and in tune with you so that we can see you, we can know you, we can see where you are leading and we cannot and we do not miss you and miss what you are doing, Lord. We want to see you. We want to know what's going on. So Lord, be with us and guide us and help us as we go throughout this week and as we go throughout our days as your children and as your servants. In your name we pray, amen.